All right, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the special Monday edition of Chem 1211 with your host, me, Dr. White. And because tomorrow is election day, it's a state holiday in Illinois, and all schools are closed, including online. Now, tomorrow's election day, but as you can see, I voted. You should vote too. I voted on Thursday. Actually, I had an absentee ballot and I dropped it off at the local polling place. That's early voting where I live in Schaumburg. I was really grateful to see the drop box was manned by someone who was indoors and they checked to make sure you filled out the outside correctly, which was good. All right, remember, vote, I did you should do. This is probably the most important election in my lifetime, and I'll bet in the last 200 years almost. All right, another thing, as many of you probably know, Saturday was Halloween. It was a strange Halloween since I didn't want to get sick. And I, where I live, they suggested sign you put on your door, which I did, saying no trick or treat, please which was sad, but <laughs> to give out candy and get sick and die, no. So anyways, I didn't, but I could see through the window when I looked out a couple of times, there were a lot of trick-or-treaters out. I don't understand, but sad thing is the next class after Halloween, Dr. White always gives out candy in my class. I can't. See what you're missing? By the way, I always give out at least two for each student, and you're missing it this year. But sometime we'll make it up. Uh, by the way, I give candy by my golden rule of Halloween candy. Don't give candy to others that you wouldn't want yourself. And this is one of my favorite. And my other favorite is the cookies and cream Hershey bars. But these are really good. My, meet mine too. My favorite, Kitty Cat. Thank you, Diana. And, but these are dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, one other thing, let me bring you up to speed on, and that is my nose is itching, excuse me. But must be itchy nose Monday. But anyways, this Thursday we'll have our normal class, assuming the world keeps on going. I hope it does. And um, there will be no lab, but we will have full lecture. I'm glad everybody voted or will. You should. Brave men and women have died so we can vote. And I've never met, missed an election, a national or state. One time I missed a local primary that was like in April, but that was only once. In, all the years I've been voting. All right, let's get to work because we've got a lot to do today. I was talking about solutions. Also, uh, one other important, uh, two things now that I remember. One, on Thursday, I will go through the gas problem set. Two, I got an email through a thread going on of chemical fac faculty here at COD that supposedly you should have received an email about a rebate, a refund for your temp kit. Did any of you get that? If not, I'll send out the email and you can check your email, student email, that you should have gotten something. If not... It's about the, uh, the chemistry kit? Yeah. Okay, what about... Um, could you repeat one more time, please? All right. Uh, there was an email thread going around uh, in the last week that supposedly, uh, not more supposedly, the school is giving rebates for people who purchased the chemistry kit. And I asked, was it only in the bookstore? And I was told no. And what I'll do is either today or tomorrow, I'll forward to everybody that email copy of that email thread that came from, I don't know, the dean or someone. I didn't get it sent directly. It was sent to the chairman of the um, chemistry department. 
and you can look into getting some money back. Because of course, some students uh, from other classes, not anybody from ours, wondered was that real or was that some phishing email? And it turns out to be real. I processed it on Friday. I also sent a note to the IT department asking if they can confirm that it was a legitimate email and they confirmed it was. I processed it online and it was very quick process through my access. I haven't received the refund yet, but the process was really easy to get the e-refund. How much are they giving you back? It didn't say um, and it hasn't posted <laughs> yet. They said a, a portion of it, but I figure even if it was half, it's better than nothing. <laughs> That would be so nice. I'm appreciative. Yeah. yeah. Of a, what'd you pay? One ten. So that'd it's, be fifty dollars back. Yeah, with tax and shipping, it was about one hundred and thirty dollars. All right. Yeah. As I always tell someone, if you're not prepared to put that money back or put that money on a sidewalk and walk away from it, then it's good money to get back. For sure. All right. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. So, did you? Uh, one quick question. Did they send you the email originally? They did. It came from the STEM group. I, I can forward it to you, Dr. White, as All you right. can see it. Who, yeah. did, who did it come from? It you came know? from from STEM. Um, from the manufacturer? Or? No, it came from the um, from someone from COD. It, it, says oh, it was a COD email address. Yeah. STEM division. Right. Yeah. OK. Well, send me it so I can forward I everybody else. And then process it so you can get some money back. Yeah. I don't get anything back because the school paid for my kit. All right, let's get into solutions. Everybody see solvent and solute on the screen? Thumbs up, people. All right, thank you. All right, just a quick review. We were talking about solutions. Remember, solution is a mixture of two or more compounds in which neither change their chemical identity. When you mix them together, they don't react. And you have a homogeneous, it's homogeneous, meaning it's the same <clears throat> throughout. And uh, hold on one sec. Let me just do this. All right. And when we talk about solutions, there's two, ty uh, two things you should know. The solvent is the component present in a solution that's present in the greatest amount. And the other components are called solutes because they're in smaller amount than the solvent. We talked about the solubility of solute. And that's the maximum amount of solute that will dissolve in a given solvent at various conditions, such as what solvent you're using, the temperature, what solute you're trying to dissolve, other solutes present, and even the pressure sometimes. All right, new stuff. Click, switches on big time. Now, there are certain definitions when it comes to solutions that I'd like you to know. And one of them is what is a saturated solution? And a saturated solution is a solution that contains the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved under conditions which the solution exists. Temperature, pressure, things like that, solvent. And you can't put one more molecule when you got a saturated solution, you put one more molecule or a couple more, they'll precipitate right to the bottom. A solid is formed. So a saturated solution contains the maximum amount uh oh, no straight lines today. The maximum amount let's try this again. That's better. The maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in that solvent to make that solution. And that's the saturated solution. Next, the dilute solution is a solution that contains 
a small amount of solute to, to the amount that could. So if you got something that's dilute, a dilute solution, there's only a tiny amount of solute present in the solvent or solution. Bartenders do not be, don't like being top told. You know, the drink you gave me was pretty dilute. In other words, they didn't put that much alcohol. They don't like that at all. I don't go back to those bars. When I used to go to bars, I don't anymore. That was back in my wild days. Now, you should know, again, a dilute solution contains only a small amount of solute relative to what you could put in there. Now, next one is a concentrated solution. And that's a solution that contains a large amount of solute relative to the amount that could dissolve. You're not saturated, but you do have a very large amount of solute present. And this term concentrated is in our vocabulary. How many of you have ever seen, it's not as popular it was, or more than popular, nothing else existed, in orange juice. And if you go to the supermarket in the frozen section, you can get a can. Wait a second, I've got internet. I'm not getting any kickbacks from this company, but you should all see on your screen a can of Minute Maid original and notice it says frozen concentrated orange juice. What that means is the stuff that's the orange juice, all the chemicals and pulp and everything is in a high amount relative to the amount of water that's in this can. It's frozen. And what you do is you dilute it, make a lower concentration. How do you do that? You add water to this. If I remember correctly, and it's been decades since I bought this product, uh, when I was in high school, you couldn't go to the supermarket and get the orange juice that's a liquid. All you could buy was concentrate, frozen. And you'd add water. Quick Dr. White story. When I was in college, I was in a fraternity, Alpha Epsilon Pi, Lambda Chapter, yay. But anyways, and we had one of the brothers and his nickname was The Beast. <laughs> we all had nicknames, I'm not gonna tell you mine, but it had something to do with my beard. My beard used to be out to this far in college. My hair used to be down, don't even think of it. Oh, I see some of you are thinking of it. But anyways, The Beast used to like to eat concentrated orange juice right out of the can. Ah, yeah. <laughs> that was one of the reasons he was called the beast, but he was a nice guy. He also didn't like wearing shoes or socks, especially until the first snow. He used to walk everywhere barefoot, except to dinner, we said, you gotta put on no shoes, no food. But anyways, he used to eat concentrate. Oh, I gotta be so tired. But anyways, those labels for solutions are in our daily life. So concentrated solution, there's a large amount of solute relative to the amount that could dissolve. Now, probably the most important definition I'll teach you this morning is aqueous solution. Aqueous solution is derived from the Latin word aqua, which is water. And an aqueous solution is a solution as which the water is the solvent. And you should know this. And it's abbreviated by bracket AQ close bracket. And this means aqueous solution and that immediately tells any chemist or anybody else who knows this, which you do, that the solution 
that this solution, the solvent is water. So let's go back and review this once more. Saturated solution, the maximum amount of solute has been, that can be dissolved is dissolved. In other words, you've reached a limit. You can't dissolve any more solute in that solution under the conditions at which exist, temperature and solvent mainly. A dilute solution has a small amount of solute relative to the amount of uh, solute that could dissolve. Concentrated solution has a large amount of solute relative to the amount of solute that could dissolve. And finally, aqueous solution, that's the solution in which water is the solvent. Now there's another one that I'll turn the switch off. Non-aqueous, non means not. Non-aqueous solution is a solution where the substance other than water is a solvent. An example of a non-aqueous solution, which you're all quite familiar with, is gasoline. Trust me, you don't want any water in your gasoline when you buy it. Back in the 60s and 70s, that was a problem buying gasoline because sometimes there'd be water in some of the poorer gasoline companies or poor quality gasoline companies. And that frees up in your fuel line in the winter and your car wouldn't start, which is not fun. That never happened to me. I think it happened once to my father. He had a VW uh, bug and he just went and got some boiling water and poured it over the fuel line, uh, not boiling, but hot water, and it melted it and he got his car started. It was interesting. My father loved uh, Volkswagen Beetles, the bug which aren't the most powerful of cars. My mother was a speed demon. The car I learned how to drive, I knew how to drive the Volkswagen, but my mother had a 1964 Chevy Impala Super Sport with a 427 engine. And did that thing rock and move fast? It beat about just anything on the street. She likes speed, so do I. All right, so we have non-aqueous solution. The solvent is not water. Now, switches off on this slide. What happens when you mix two things together and form a solution? We have interparticle interactions. The solute-solute interactions, sometimes called hydrogen bonding, and also called uh, Van der Waals forces have to be broken. And solvent solvent attractions, hydrogen bonding or Van der Waals or ionic, have to be broken. And then new attractions are formed between the solvent and the solute. Now, what are factors? that affect this rate of solution formation. How quickly can you dissolve one, a solute in a solvent? Again, switches off on this slide. Uh, how big is the pieces of what you're trying? If it's a solid, powder versus larger chunks. Uh, we'll do that in a lab. The, excuse me, the degree of agitation when you mix it, how fast do you mix it? and the temperature of the solution will affect how quickly you can form a solution. I think most of you, well, maybe not. Have you ever made a sugar solution or syrup solution? And if you have a lot of time to waste, take some cold water, pour in the sugar and start mixing for a long time. If you don't want to waste time, you put the water in a pan, put it on the stove, heat it up, and while it's heating up, pour in your sugar, and it goes a lot quicker because you're heating it up. You're adding energy to break certain forces to make it dissolve quicker. All right, can I have everybody's attention? If the dial on a 
on the next thing I'm going to talk only goes to 20. I've just turned it to 100. And now, when it comes to solubility, there's a very important concept that's not a law, but it's a rule of thumb. And a rule of thumb tells you that it's mostly true, but not 100% true. And I'll be subtle, know this. And that rule of thumb is light dissolves light. And what it means is substances of like polarity tend to be more soluble, or just think about, about being soluble in each other than others. Know this, light dissolves light. This is a generalization, or otherwise known as a rule of thumb. It's about 95%. It's not true with, well, it's mostly true. I would say mostly. And considered a polarity of medicine. I'll get to that in a little while. All right, what does like dissolve like mean? And as I said, things of like polarity are soluble and other things of the same polarity. Well, what do we mean by polarity? When you look at key things, there's polar and nonpolar substances. Now, what's the most polar thing? Water. Salts are polar and alcohols and alcohols like rubbing alcohol is propyl alcohol ethanol and drinks and there's some other things uh, an example of an alcohol you don't know about but i'm an organic chemist is sugar sugar is not the kind of alcohol that will get you inebriated that means drunk but it has uh, o oxygen with a hydrogen and a carbon and that's the definition of an alcohol and I think you all know sugar is very soluble in water. Now, what are things that are nonpolar? Well, first of all, we can think of gasoline is nonpolar, vegetable oil is nonpolar. Uh, what would be another one? Uh, baby oil. and Vaseline, and there are other, oh, two very important ones that you don't think about as chemicals or substances, dirt and grease. Now, what does light dissolve like? If you take water and vegetable oil, water is polar, vegetable oils, nonpolar, mix them together. Uh oh, warning, artwork from Dr. White. If you mix them together, you'll see at the bottom is water. And at the top is your veg oil. Why? Because vegetable oil has a lower density than water. This is about 0 0.8. This is 1.0 which is why water is at the bottom. All right, 
Everybody see the wishbone on the screen? That was my mother's favorite dressing. If you make your own, it's better. But do you notice right here at this bottle, it's not homogeneous. And it looks like they just mixed it up for this picture because it usually is a little more of this clear liquid, which is the vegetable oil, less water. Or then again, maybe nowadays it's more water because that's cheaper. But anyways, this is an oil vinaigrette dressing. And you see the two layers because the top, the oil part is vinegar, I'm not vinegar, is vegetable oil. And the bottom part is vinegar, which is mostly water. And this oil vinaigrette, ooh, it adds bold flavor. I haven't had this in decades because if you know how to cook, you can make your own cheaper and better. But this is an example of like to solve life. The bottom layer is polar, the top layer is nonpolar, and because like to solve life, things that aren't the same polar are not polarity, are not soluble. Now, quick story. If you look at this list, on this list, nonpolar vegetable oil, you don't think about it, but Vaseline is also nonpolar. And many years ago, I had a very, how should I put this properly, very studious and sharp 1211 oh, student. I just showed him that chart, everybody in the class. Key break. And he raised his hand. I said, how can I help you? He said, well, if that's true, if I mix Vaseline and vegetable oil, will that be soluble? I said, it should be, but I've never done it. I'll tell you what, next lab, when we go into the lab, I'll bring you a beaker or both. Do you want to mix them together in front of the class? He said, sure. So I did, he took some Vaseline, put it in a beaker of vegetable oil, stirring it up, and lo and behold, homogeneous solution, like the Zell's like, which is a rule of thumb, no, it's on this thumb, uh, was true. And that's a very important thing. Now, let's take a look at a problem with like to solve like. If I were in class, you'd have to wait while I was writing it out. Everybody see the problem? Let me decode it for you. And the question is, substance A is soluble in baby oil, but it's not soluble in water. What is the polarity of substance A, and how do you know this? Boy, that how looks like awful. That's better. Well, let's do this. Baby oil. Is nonpolar. Water is polar. And A is soluble in baby oil.
and therefore, since A is soluble in baby oil, which is nonpolar, and not soluble in water, which is polar, I immediately know A is nonpolar. And how do I know that? Light dissolves light. And that's how you do. Oh, I should share one with you. Now you have bad hair days. I'm having a bad writing tablet day. All right, your turn. Substance B is soluble in water, but not soluble in vegetable oil. What is the polarity of B? If I say substance B, it should be B. And how do you know this? And just to remind you, Polar, water, salts, alcohol, nonpolar, gasoline, vegetable oil, baby oil, Vaseline, dirt, and grease. How fun. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up or a smile or do the none of the above or something different. In case you didn't write this down. Now this I'm expecting you to learn on your own, but I will tell you like the Zao's like. I may change my mind on the polarities, but yeah, I think that's something you should learn. All right, looks like everybody's done. Let's take a look at this. Substance B is soluble in water. Just to recap, substance B is soluble in water. Substance B is insoluble in vegetable oil. Water, you should know, is the most polar substance known to chemistry on our planet or anywhere else. Vegetable oil is nonpolar. Therefore, B is polar. Now, how do you know that? Because light dissolves light. 
and this is probably one of the most important principles I know in all of chemistry, because we use it a lot, and I mean a lot. Now, if we go up to this original list, you'll see I included two things, dirt and grease. If you ever got your hands dirty or your clothes dirty and you put it under the water and go like this, oh, they're still dirty. How do you get them clean? You use soap. And soap is an interesting thing. If, you, if I don't teach 12, 12, uh, 12, 12 here, but I still teach organic chemistry at ECC, Elgin Community College. I teach all about soap and how it works, by the way, that's organic chemistry. Chemistry is everywhere around you. You just don't know about it or starting to learn about it. And there's special molecules we call surfactants and they help chemicals overcome polarity differences. The switch is off on this slide and promote solubility. Examples of uh, surfactants are soaps and laundry detergents. And surfactants, this won't be on test, have a polar head and a nonpolar tail. And the polar head attracts to water. The nonpolar tail attracts the nonpolar things, and they create something that now will go into water and take the dirt off you. And that's a quick review how surfactants and slide was off. Now, what if I told one of you to, hey, could you go into the lab, or maybe two of you, could you go separately, I say, go into the lab and make me a salt solution. Mix some salt and water together. Would both of you come back with the same solution? No. And I'd bet on it. By the way, Dr. White only bets when I know I win. So if I say I bet on it, I know I'm right. So what do you do? So if I ask someone and someone else on another day, make me a salt solution or sugar or other things, that it will be the same. And there we use the first, the contra, uh, concept of concentration in solutions. And the concentration is the amount of solute present in a specific amount of solution. Now, I won't ever ask you what is the definition for concentration, but I'll use it. All right, now there are different ways of measuring concentration. On this slide, I'm going to turn the switch off, but I still like you to know about it because you can use this in your daily life. And one way is called percent mass. And everybody see that on your screen now? Thank you. Now, percent concentration, also sometimes uh, where you have percent by mass, is the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100. And remember, the mass of the solution is the mass of the solute times the mass of the solvent. Now, a lot of things you buy you'll see the percent concentration, or I'll just say percent, what they really mean is percent mass. And the higher the percent mass, again, it switches off for this slide, the greater amount of that chemical or substance is in that solution. Now, we're sort of done with the season now, at least I hope we are, but in summer, what do you put on your skin so you don't get attacked by mosquitoes, you put on mosquito repellent. And 
there's a certain chemical in all the good mosquito repellents that does the mosquito repelling. How it does it, I don't know. I'm an organic chemist. I know how to make it, but I don't know physiologically how to mosquitoes that I don't like that. I'm flying away. I don't know. But anyways, when I moved into the house I'm in many, many years ago, I was doing my lawn like I still do, and I've got a big front and back lawn. I went out early one morning, started on a Saturday, all of a sudden, zoom, I got attacked by every mosquito in the neighborhood. Well, I can't do this. I'm going to be look, eaten up. So I went to Walmart and I looked where they had the mosquito repellents. Now they had a name brand off and then they had the Walmart brand. Now the Walmart brand and the name brand was the same size bottle, same amount of liquid. Now the name brand costs twice as much as the Walmart. Well, is that a good deal or not? You don't know. But Dr. White knows, and I'll share it to you, the chemical that causes the uh, fly, fleas, fleas, flies to stay mosquitoes. No, I don't have any fleas, thank God. But anyways, uh, to stay off your skin is DEET, D-E-T. That's the acronym for diethyl uh, tulamid. And uh, it's a chemical that they make, chemists make, you spray it on, the mosquitoes stay away. Well, if you looked at the label off, it was 2.4% D, which is by mass. If you looked at the Walmart, it was 4.4%. So not only are you getting more chemical, the important stuff, but it's half the price, meaning also you have to use less because it's stronger. So guess what I bought and I still have downstairs. Uh, I've never had any problem with it. And unfortunately, over the years, sometimes I have sensitive skin, but I would look it up uh, and find out. But the Walmart brand, it doesn't, I forgot the name of it. I've been buying ever since. And over the years, it still has more DEET and it costs less. And how do I know I was getting a good buy? I looked at the percent concentration of the important key chemical. Being an organic chemist, I knew what the key chemical is. Also, how many of you have ever seen the uh, spray cans of the mold disinfectant? And there, it's a quaternary ammonium salt. I have a number of patents in quaternary ammonium salts as disinfectants and other things antimicrobial compounds, and also fabric softeners. So I know that area quite well. And one year I had some uh, minor flood damage. And I could smell it was getting moldy and all that, even though I washed it up and everything, cleaned it with bleach. So I went to, again, Walmart, you go to Target too, and they had the spray disinfectants. One is Lysol, Clorox puts out one. And I know there's a quaternary ammonium salt, that's the active ingredient. And they had same size can, spray can for the name brand and Walmart brand was same thing. And again, about half the price. I looked at the labels, they have the same amount. But sometimes when something's less expensive, they put less of that active chemical in there. But I look at the key compound, it's quaternary ammonium. The name brand had about 2%. The Walmart brand had about almost double, 4%. Again, putting a lot more of the good stuff in there. You know what I bought. And it was on a wall where I had some cement, even though I cleaned it, I sprayed it, and it knocked down the mold and smell. So concentration, the more, higher that number, when it's by percent by mass, the more of that chemical is in the solution. By the way, spray cans are solutions too. Now, switches off on the next one, and that's percent volume. And percent volume is another way of determining concentration, 
switches off on this slide. And that's how do you do percent volume? That's volume of the solute, milliliters, per volume of the solution. I don't have it here. Times 100. And so again, volume of the solution is the volume of the solute plus the volume of the solvent. And the higher the number when you have percent by volume, the more of the solute is present. Again, switches off. Now, probably the most common place to find percent by volume and I think I had you off. So let's do that again. Again, everybody. Can you see it all right now? All right, I don't think I had that on. Okay, thank you, Kim. Percent volume is volume of the solute divided by volume of the solution times 100. Volume of the solution is volume of the solute plus volume of solvent. Switches off, I'll never put this on a test. So the higher percent volume, the more solute that's present. And where do you find this? Mostly on bottles of wine. If you look at a bottle of wine, an important solute in wine is ethanol, the alcohol. And the higher the alcohol level, the stronger you can get drunk, ooh, I shouldn't say that, inebriated by that wine. And if you look at it, certain wines are like four, eight, 10, 12%. By the way, my favorite wines, because I worked in the area, the region where the wine came from in Germany, I would go there. One company I worked for had a big research and uh, site and also a chemical plant that I went to in Germany a lot. And that was uh, in Emmerich in uh, Deutschland. It's Frecke Deutsch. I speak German. It's rusty now because I haven't been there in a couple of decades. But Dr. White likes, loves Pierce Porter, Golden Trachen, Cabernet, or Spät Laser or Ouch Laser. Cabernet is the sweetest of the white German wines. Spät Laser is sweeter, and Ouch Laser is the sweetest. And Dr. White loves Ouch Laser. And the Pierce Porter, Golden Trachen, any of those three are just Years ago, I used to buy that by the case until I realized that's not good for my weight. So I only buy a bottle here and there. You go to Binney's and I don't get any kickbacks from them. They sell it and it's not expensive either. It's only about eight to twelve dollars a bottle, but it's good. Now with me looking at the clock, oh no, time flies when you're having fun with chemistry and Dr. White. It's time for my five minute break so I can go stretch my back, which is getting better. And maybe this week I'll be able to sleep in my bed. I've been sleeping in my laser boy, but tomorrow I'll talk to my physical therapist. That I'll see in five.
Let's get started. Everybody back yet? See everybody coming back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, one thing while I was doing my extra stretching, which I now feel a lot better, as you can tell, I'm smiling. Uh, I was thinking something, well, I forgot to tell you something. And it concerns like dissolved like, that's where you use surfactants. So uh, years ago, and he moved out of the area, I had a friend who would come over to my home and park in my driveway of my garage. He had an older car and the older car, guess what it did? It leaked oil. And when he left, there'd be a spot of oil on my driveway. And it didn't look good. But luckily, Dr. White is an organic chemist who knows light dissolves light, and water alone won't get the job done. But what I did is, and it's probably the best product out there, in my personal opinion, take some Dawn uh, dishwasher dish detergent, put it on there, as is with a little bit of water, take a uh, one of those either scrub brushes, scrub it, let it sit for about five minutes, and then with a wet sponge, clean it off. Don't spray it down with a hose, because that's just going to take it down the driveway. And after a while, I got tired of it, and I said, could you please park on the street? I don't care if you leak on there, but not my driveway. And he apologized and he parked on the street after that. That way, after he left, I didn't have to go and clean my driveway. But Dawn is a really good way of getting rid of things like nonpolar. Yep, Dawn is the best. Even cleans little birds, as you see on. And I know someone who was involved in a cleanup after the Gulf of Oil spill. All right. So we went through percent volume. Now, let's talk about the most important concentration measurement, and that's molarity. I've just turned the switch. Will this be on a test? On, and actually it's a dial, and I turned it to 500. That's how important, yep, 500. That's how important molarity concept is. And we use it all the time in chemistry. What is molarity? Molarity Just checking. Everybody see molarity on the screen? Thank you. All right. Molarity is a concentration, measure of concentration, giving the number of moles of solute per liter of solution. So molarity, which is abbreviated by a capital M, not small, is moles of solute per one liter of solution. And in the past, I used to make students memorize this, but this will be important information in test three, but very important, know this. Notice four explanation marks. Wow, this is important stuff. Now, molarity, moles of solute per one liter of solution. Now, since one liter, which is a volume measurement, equals 1,000 milliliters, this is a definition. Both of these are exact numbers. Therefore, if we know molarity equals moles per liter. It also equals moles, and this is a solute, per 1,000 milliliters. And therefore, what you should know
is moles of solute per 1,000 milliliters, and we don't put down solution. It's not solvent, it's solution. But we rarely put that. This is an exact number. This is not. It's something that is a sig figure, whatever it is. Therefore, molarity, moles of solute per 1,000 milliliters of solution. Now, let's look at something important you should know. Molarity, which is abbreviated by capital M, equals moles solute per 1,000 milliliters. And this is an important thing and we make up all the time stock solutions. And if you look right here, the question is three points. What does this mean? And notice I have 1.53 capital M HCl, which is a chemical. And whenever you see capital M, that means molarity, which is moles of solute per 1,000 milliliters. So what does that mean? 1.53 moles of HCl per 1,000 milliliters. You could also put down a liter, but you'll find later on working in the lab and problems on the test, use 1,000 milliliters, make your life easier. Your turn, what does this mean? Four point, and that's a one, 4.731 capital M NaCl. What does that mean? And when you're done, give me a thumbs up or smile or give me the high sign. Oh, by the way, no drinking in class. No, I'm just kidding. All right, let's take a look at this. What does this mean? As soon as you see capital M, that means molarity. And remember, molarity equals moles solute. That's what you dissolve in the solvent per 1,000 milliliters of solution. So if we look at what does this mean? 4.731 moles NaCl per 1,000 milliliters. Oh, let's do another one. Why don't you try this one? 6.01 times 10 to the fifth capital M sugar. I don't know if you can make it that concentrated, but what does that mean if you could?
All right, looks like everybody's done. Let's do this. As soon as you see capital M, that's molarity. Capital M. And that means, what does this mean? 6.01 times 10 to the fifth moles of sugar per 1,000 milliliters. Ooh, let's do another one. But let's make this I'll do this one, then I'll let you have it. And let me decode this four points. What does 3.75 capital M H2SO4 bracket AQ close bracket mean? And what is the solvent? Well, as soon as you see capital M, that's molarity. which is equal to moles solute oops, per 1,000 milliliters. So as soon as I see capital M, that means it's 3.75, capital M tells you moles, H2SO4, that's sulfuric acid, per 1,000 milliliters. Well, what about what is the solvent? Well, see right here. Oh, look, I'm going to do some fancy color. If you haven't figured out, red is my favorite color. Just look what I'm wearing today. But anyways, what is bracket AQ close bracket mean? It means the solvent. is water. So this is the first part. This is the second part of what you should do. Again, bracket AQ close bracket means aqueous means the solvent is water. Your turn. What does 9.121 capital M NaOH, that's sodium hydroxide, bracket AQ close bracket mean? And what is the solvent of the solution? All right, I think everybody's done. Let's take a look at this. As soon as you see capital M with some numbers and a chemical, immediately you know molarity. Molarity. Moles of solute per 1,000 milliliters of solvent. Therefore, what does this mean? Go all the way over here. 9.121. Capital M means moles of solute, in this case, sodium hydroxide, per 
1,000 milliliters. You can put a liter there, but this is better. And what is the solvent? Well, bracket, AQ, close bracket, aqueous. And the solvent is water. And that's, oh, let's do one more. And the answer is, a uh, question is, I got the horse, cart before the horse that time. What does this mean? 0 0.0130 capital M KCl potassium chloride. All right, everybody done? Let's do it. What does this mean? As soon as you see capital M with some numbers in a chemical formula, you know that's molarity. Molarity. And it equals moles, solute, per 1,000 milliliters solvent. Therefore, what does this mean? 0 0.0130 moles KCl per 1,000 milliliters. Remember, this is an exact number. Ooh, I'm gonna, how many significant figures in this number? 0 0.0130. Dr. White's being mean today. Time's up. Uh, lead zeros are never significant. All non-zero numbers are one, three, zeros after a decimal that are not lead are significant. So this would have three significant figures. And if you couldn't figure that out, come to my office hour. Don't forget I'll have one tonight. Now, why does Dr. White get all bent out of shape and excited about molarity? How do you like that? Excited. Oh, that was funky. But anyways, must be near electro. Oh, by the way, for those of you who came in late, see me after class so you can get your Kit Kats. Anyways. <coughs> Why is it so important? Because in laboratories, and we have it at COD, we have what's called stock solutions, bottles of different molarity material. And by knowing the molarity and having a stock solution, what if I need so many moles of something? Well, I could weigh it out, then dissolve it, and make a solution. There I am. If you have stock solutions made up, it's real simple. And let me show you how it's real simple. Everybody see the 10 points? You see it? Thank you.
All right, let's take a look at this. Let me decode it. In case you haven't figured out how to read my handwriting yet. And it is how many moles KCl are in 125 milliliters of a 1.27, now you see the decimal, capital M KCl solution. So the first thing, you already know the drill. What are you being asked to find? How many moles KCl? What are you given? There's 125 milliliters of the solution. What are you also given? This magic number. No, it's not magic. You already know what it is. 1.27 KCl. Now, before I go any further, because I know I should do this, what does this mean? Capital M tells me molarity. And you'll be given this important information. If we look at this, molarity is moles of solute per 1,000 milliliters. Therefore, immediately I know that's 1.27 moles KCl per 1,000 milliliters. So how do we proceed? Well, the only thing I really have to work with is this number. I have this, but I'll show you what to use it. And if I had some ratio, what units do I want to get to? Moles of KCl. And it's time to use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. <laughs> Love that. But it is your good buddy. You've been using it all semester, I hope. So how do you use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis here? Whatever you're trying to get to goes on top of the ratio. Whatever you're trying to get rid of goes underneath. Here I want moles KCl. Here I want milliliters of solution. Where do I get these numbers? From knowing this really means this. So I can immediately put in 1.27 moles of KCl per 1,000 milliliters. Now, let me remind you, anything divided by itself equals one, cancels out. Milliliters divided by milliliters cancel out. What units am I left with? Moles of KCl. That's what I want. Now, let me remind you, this 1,000 is an exact number. It plays no role in determining significant figures. The 125 is three significant figures. The 1.27 is three significant figures. Dr. White is in this three significant figure rut. So your answer should be that. And good news, I did something. Let's see how well it works out. I did the spreadsheet and it's already formatted. I've been thinking about doing that for years and I finally did it. Yay, Dr. White. So this would be plus 125 times 1.27 divided by 1,000. Dr. And White, we can't see your spreadsheet. Oh, no. Quick, call the spreadsheet, please. Somebody stole my spreadsheet. Can you see it now? Yes, thank you. Let's do it again. 125. Uh, times 1.27 divided by 1,000. And the number I get is 1.5875, blah, blah, blah. 
times 10 to the minus one. I'll let you round that off to three significant figures. Time's up. Keep the one, keep the five, keep the eight. Use the seven to round off. So that's five or higher The 1.59 times 10 to the minus one, or there's another way you could write it too, and I'll show you that. You see the whiteboard now? Good. So this would be 1. Point, oh, come back here. 1.59 times 10 to the minus 1. Or you could have written it this way. Either way is the same answer. Both are three significant figures. That's a 9. And that's how you do it. Oh, let's do another one. All right, I'll do this partially, but the first of all, let me read this. How many milliliters of a 4.731? Hold on one second. Four point seven three one capital M. NaOH, and I could have put down solution, must you use to get 1.444 moles sodium hydroxide? Now, I'm going to do the math part, but the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is you figure out what are you being asked to find and what are you given? That's your job right now. Go. And I ask you to do the math, I'll do that, but just figure out what are you being asked to find and what are you given? All right, time's up. Put down your pens and pencils. Watch the screen. First of all, what are you being asked to find? How many milliliters? What are you given? Well, this strange number. No, it's not strange because you know what it means. What else are you given? And now at this point, we've got everything we need to know. Now, what do we have to work with? Well, really this. And what am I trying to get to? Well, we figured that out. Milliliters of solution. So how do we proceed? Well, you use your good buddy, your good friend. Well, that was a long one. Unit analysis. That was a funny one. And you know the drill. 
when you use your good buddy, your good friend, your analysis, whenever you're trying to get to, goes on top of the ratio. Whenever you're trying to get rid of, goes underneath. Now, where do I get these numbers? Well, you come over here and say, what does this mean? Capital M, molarity, 4.731, capital M, NaOH means 4.731 moles NaOH, sodium hydroxide, per 1,000 milliliters. Therefore, if I put 1,000 here, I know I'll have 4.731 there. And now, before I go any further, remember anything divided by itself equals 1. Moles of sodium hydroxide divided by moles of sodium hydroxide cancel out. The only units I'm left with are what I want. Remember, this is how many significant? Four. This is how many? Four. This is an exact number. So my answer should have four sig figures. And now I'll go to my calculator. And I put in 1.444 times 1,000 divided by 4.731. All right. Sometimes spreadsheets make you do this. You don't have to do it on your calculator. Now it should work. And here's the number. Now, I'm going to let you have some fun. You round that off to four significant figures. All right, time's up. Keep the three, keep the zero, keep the five, keep the two. Use this two to round off. Is that four or less or five or higher? And eh, time's up. Hopefully I'll pick four or less. So I'm gonna drop that two and everything else afterward and not change anything. That would be 3.052 times 10 squared, which would be my answer. And now I can put it here. I'm gonna move it down here so I have more room. And what that tells me is, if I measure out 305.2 milliliters of this solution, I'll have exactly these many moles. And that's the beauty. Hold on, I see someone having a question. Uh, Marie, no, that would be a different number. Because when you use scientific notation, uh, the number in front of the times is always never less than one, never 10 or greater. So then if you want, ask me after class and I'll, we can see how you got that and why that's not the right thing. And as always, all questions are good questions. Now. Why is molarity and having stock solutions so important? If I need so many milliliters of a solution, what do I do? Well, I know the molarity of the solution and you can get very accurate molarities. I can determine, all I have to do is measure out a certain amount of that solution 
in a graduated cylinder to get how many moles I need. And that makes my life really easy. And guess what? It's good to make your life really easy. Let's go through this again, because this is something new for you. We're asked to find how many milliliters of this 4.731 capital M and AOA solution must be used to get these many moles, 1.441 moles of sodium hydroxide. And here we have, we're trying to find milliliters. We're given this number and the capital M tells you molarity and we know molarity is moles of solute per thousand milliliters, in this case 4.731 moles of NaOH per thousand milliliters. And now we go, and this is all we have to start with, moles of NaOH. We want to get the milliliters and you use your good body. I'm not going to overdose you with the siren today, but whatever you're trying to get to goes on top of the ratio. Whatever you're trying to get rid of goes underneath. Now, notice in the first one, we use the ratio moles per milliliters. In the second one, we use the inverse of that. And we did something similar when we went from moles to grams or grams to moles. And this is where unit analysis helps you. You don't have to memorize this. You use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. And I'll let you set this up. 10 points. Ooh, how many moles KBR in 475 milliliters of a 1.75 times 10 to the minus 2 capital M KBR solution? Your turn. Have fun. You don't have a calculator. Just try and figure out what are you being asked to find? What are you given? And then try and use your good buddy, your good friend, Unit analysis to set it up. And I'll even be nice because this will be given to you the important information for test number three, which is coming up soon. There you go.
And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. Take your time. I don't have a plane to catch today. But I do have a class at one o'clock, so you got to be done before then. I'll give you another minute. As we finish early, please be patient. I try and give everybody time to finish. Thank you for your patience. All right, if you're done, give me a thumbs up. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's do it. I'll give you another 10 seconds. Seven, eight, ten. Time's up. I have a funky timer. All right, let's do this. First of all, what are we trying to find? Moles KBR. What are we given? Oops. Four seventy five milliliters of solution and this number. As soon as I see capital M, I ask myself, what does that mean? And it means one point seven five capital M is molarity times ten to the minus two moles KBR, potassium bromide, per 1,000 milliliters of solution. Now, the only number I really have to start with is this. What units do I want my answer to be in? Moles potassium bromide KBR. And now I'll use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis, Whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top of the ratio. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. Therefore, on top, I want moles KBR. 
underneath, I want milliliters. Where do I get these numbers? From knowing that this really means this. And I have 1.75 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of KBR per 1,000 milliliters. Already got that written there. And now notice milliliters divided by milliliters cancel out. I'm left with moles KBR, which is what I want. So now I'm going to go to my calculator. And here's what my calculator gives me. And if we looked at 1.475, three significant figures, 1.75, three significant figures, and 1,000 exact number, round this off to three significant figures. And that will be 8.31 times 10 to the minus three moles. And that's how you do it. Sorry, one well, we went a little over today, but first of all, don't forget to vote. If you haven't, I believe you can still go today or tomorrow and register and vote at the same time. I know last week, a colleague at the other school who had never voted before registered and voted the same day. Uh, don't forget, no class tomorrow. I'll see you on Thursday. The lab we did last week is due this Thursday. However, there's no lab this Thursday because election week. And I figured I could slip it in and look at the syllabus. And with that, if you wanted to put it nine scientific, Dr. White knows how to convert from one to the other. So I won't take points over. But well, with that, I'll say <laughs> goodbye. We're done for today. I'll see you on Thursday at our regular time on Thursday. Gang is on. Pray for our country after tomorrow, whatever happens. And I'll see you on Thursday. Gang is on. Goodbye.